they say that forests are a magical place. A mysterious realm full of wonder and magic. Moments that you can observe if you only just look. It was 2021 in Sydney, Australia, and the second lockdown we were having was pretty hard. I decided to move to Centennial Park to my own studio apartment. A fortunate choice, as a few days after that, we went into a five kilometre radius lockdown. Centennial Park was now my whole world. It was an emotional time for me, isolated from friends and the great outdoors. But at the same time, I now had the parklands next door to me. My new home, a world of wonder and beauty. Many people believe that the spirits of nature hold great healing powers, that the animals of the forest are gatekeepers to the spirit realm. For me, this proved to be true. My head wasn't in a great place, but I still had my passion, a relentless desire to search for the beauty in nature. It was as if the universe heard my calling, the forest spirits opening their doors for me to enter. Because within a few hundred metres from my new home was a new family too. A family of powerful owls. The owls had laid two eggs which hatched into two incredibly adorable owlets. They had been living inside a tree hollow for a few weeks and had just taken their first steps outside. With my university course put on hold until lockdown was over, I had the time necessary to document the early stages of these owlets' lives. my lens, they became a portal for me. A portal which transported me into their world, close up amongst the tallest tree branches, sitting beside them, able to be a part of their newly discovered world. The first few weeks of filming were a learning curve. The owls often placed themselves high up in the trees. There was a very small window of visibility to see them. Not only were the parents somewhat camouflaged, but the tree's foliage made them very difficult to find. So many sticks, branches and leaves blocking my view. But this was a part of their realm. Protected and hidden in the trees. A special place for the new owlets to find themselves. Filming at huge focal lengths like this often manifest issues that don't occur for most filmmakers. The smallest shake of the lens in the wind would deem the footage unusable. I can't say I've spent much time filming birds before. It seemed that I was paired well with the owlets, 
they learning about their environment and existence. And me learning how to navigate my new environment, how to find them, study them and film them. Sometimes the owls would fly to another branch. I would try to follow them on camera. But sometimes things don't always work out the way we want. When I lost them on camera, originally I would kind of panic and try to find them as quickly as possible. I think because the camera's field of view was quite narrow, any large movements from the owls would throw off my perspective on where they were. Did they fly three meters away, 30 meters? I then thought about, in my own personal life, how my narrow-mindedness might affect my perspective on life going on around me. How do we change that? How do we work on ourselves to be more aware of our surroundings if we can't see it? For me, filming the hours it became possible. Take my eye off the camera viewfinder and look around. What can I see? What are the other hours looking at? Can I hear anything else? I'm a firm believer that we can find patterns and moments in nature that can reflect our own lives. A perspective only possible if given the time to think, the time to analyze, and to be introspective while also seeing the bigger world outside ourselves. It seemed like the gate to the owl's realm was becoming wider, enticing me and pulling me in further. Over the course of the next few weeks, I had developed a strong connection to this family. Not only was I spending so long out with them, filming them during the day and night, but also after each filming session, I was ingesting the footage onto my computer. It gave me this immense feeling of knowing them personally, knowing the way they would act or react to a certain situation, knowing the feelings they felt just by looking at how they were behaving. In some way, I felt a part of their family. I spent so much time watching them, listening to them. Over the weeks, I found that while filming the hours during the day created the best quality of images, filming them at night opened up a whole other world of their activity. They are, after all, nocturnal animals. I wasn't used to shooting in such dark conditions. It was near pitch black to the naked eye. I had to open my senses up, become more aware of my surroundings, and learn the ways of the forest at night. It was only with a full moon and clear skies that I could venture deep into the night and capture their habits. To start with, the parent would fly over to where the owlets were and he would hold certain bits of food in his beak and allow the young to grab it.
a storm was approaching. I was used to shooting in harsh weather, but the storm looked pretty big. The owls, of course, oblivious. A great opportunity to see how the owls handled the harsher weather, I thought. I decided to lock off my tripod and hide underneath it to keep dry as the rain really started to pick up. came closer, I decided to call it a night and go home to back up and review the footage. The storm continued well into the night, howling winds and heavy rain until late morning the next day. When the rain subsided enough for me to venture out, I decided to go and check on the owls. Perhaps they would have found a sheltered area to keep dry. They were sitting a bit lower in the trees than I expected. In fact, this was probably the lowest I'd seen them. But something wasn't right. I was heavily saddened to only find three owls, both owlets and one of the parents. While sometimes a parent might be sitting a few meters away from the others, in this case, they were no longer to be found. I searched for almost three hours, looking up in the trees. I didn't want to come to any conclusions too early, but considering this was the first and biggest storm to hit the family, was it possible that one of the parents died? The other owls seemed to know something was wrong. Overcome with the wetness and rain that had hammered them all of the night just past. A cold, wet and quiet day.
I wanted to stay longer to somehow comfort them in their time of need. But my heart started to feel heavy. I departed, head hung low, back to my house. The weather remained cold and wet for the rest of the day and into the night. A day had passed and I wanted to go back to check on the owls. Lo and behold, all four hours. Where had the parent gone? Why had they not returned that day? Were they lost or injured? They didn't look injured. Questions. Questions that I had no answer to. Did it matter? They were all there, safe and partially dry. Spring was definitely in the air. A Kurawong had recently nested nearby to the powerful owls, and being a territorial bird started to attack the powerful owl parent. Being as the powerful owls are very large, and the Kurawong so small, the Kurawong's advances were barely felt by the owl.
was more of a nuisance for the owl, who would then simply change to another branch nearby. Now I'm sure this owl could have attacked or shown its dominance, but it didn't. Why? I think because it simply just wasn't that much of a concern to it. A lesson I thought, not letting the small things get to you, not allowing the everyday nuisances to affect your routine. With spring comes all sorts of activities in the parklands, from the birth of grey-headed flying fox pups to the migration of bees and birth of baby swans. I was filming the owls one day and noticed the sound of a swarm of bees close by. Quite close, in fact, as when I turned, they were about 10 metres away. Thousands of bees. They all eventually landed on this leaf, now the size of a football, huddled together. They seemed docile, not aggressive in any way. All of a sudden, they decided to leave. Thousands of bees departing the leaf, all within about 30 seconds. It was magical to see. There were other beautiful sights to be had at the same time though. The swans had given birth to their chicks, called cygnets, and they were ever so cute.
the local grey-headed flying foxes were also parenting their newborn young, seeing their adorable little faces peeking out from the safety of mum's chest. So much life, so many new beginnings prevalent in the park. It felt ecstatic. So many stories, so many new experiences. But I could only be in one place at a time and was already heavily invested in the hour documentation. They were, after all, my primary focus. I was visiting the owls one day and noticed the family all sitting together. Often it's hard to see them clearly, so I was in luck. I noticed that one of the parents had a possum in its claw, holding onto it for consumption later that evening, perhaps. A little while went on and the owls had moved around a bit. I was filming one of the parents that were intently looking at something lower in the tree. I couldn't see what it was looking at, but then realised this was the same owl that was previously holding onto the possum. It seemed that while moving about the trees it lost its grip on the possum, which was now a few metres lower hanging in a branch. I noticed it, and seeing that the owl was eyeing it off, I reframed my camera to the possum. And not two seconds later, Viewing the footage in slow motion really showed how majestic and fast these owls are. I hadn't actually seen any footage before of a powerful owl grabbing its prey, so it was a big moment for me. I was compelled to film the owls later and later into the night. As they grew older, they became much more active at night than they were before. They were starting to obtain a level of independence and having seen so much of their behaviour, my curiosity was increasing as to what they were actually doing later into the night. But this posed a logistical and more human problem for me. I had the limiting factor of how much light my camera and lens could pick up. I'd thought about using an artificial light to film them, but that really goes against my ethos as a wildlife filmmaker. So I managed to borrow a 400mm G Master lens from Sony for a few weeks. The added level of light that the lens could take in helped tremendously in allowing me to follow the hours deeper into the night, still working around the full moon as much as possible.
Over the days and weeks filming, I noticed how the Owlets became better eaters as they learned from their parents and gained more experience. Their portions of food became larger, and they were given the opportunity to take their own portions of food. I was now filming deeper into the night more often. The mystical nature of the forest, ever growing, enticing me to observe and film more. It seemed that as my skill to spot the owls progressed, so did their elusiveness. I had to be an avid listener. The owls were teaching me to look past the surface and to listen, really listen, to what was actually going on. Something primal was being evoked in me. In the night, I was thinking less as a person and more instinctively, like an animal. Immersed in nature, heightening all my senses, becoming one with my intuition, my instincts. One night I discovered one of the owlets eating something weird. A small bird with lots of feathers, it seemed. Odd, definitely not something one of the parents would have caught and given to the owlets, as they were still mostly feeding them straight from the carcass. I would assume that this was one of the first times that an owlet had caught its own meal judging by the way it was handling the food as well as nearly dropping it. It felt great to be able to see this accomplishment, to be a part of its development, even if from an observational level. At one point, 
the owlet was handling its food and somehow fell from the tree. It must not have been paying attention to its stability. It managed to catch itself on the tree branch, but unfortunately caught its wing in the process. It was now hanging from the tree by one wing. I was concerned, but filmed for about three minutes before getting onto the phone with Wires to organise someone to come help free it. When all of a sudden, it decided it wanted to fly to another branch, and away it flew, claw holding onto its food and all. Seeing my concerns for the owl perhaps was an overreaction. But also, how amazing that it could bring itself out of that sticky situation. Of course, while the owl was hanging there stuck and I was holding my breath, the sibling remained, unconcerned, simply curious about what the heck it was doing. With the owls moving to other trees, it gave me the opportunity to have different approaches to filming. There are quite a few varieties of trees in Centennial Park, and they all look quite different. They have different thicknesses of trunks and branches, different foliage, and different vantage points. I found myself having to constantly think about different ways to shoot them. It seemed that with my expanding consciousness of these owls, other areas of my brain were expanding too. I was starting to look at all things differently, to think about different perspectives on things before coming to any conclusions. And this surprised me. Not the fact that I realized that, but rather that there was a clear connection between my experience in nature filming these hours and my own personal life. siblings gained a stronger connection over time, but 
as the weeks went on, they became inseparable. My favourite moments filming the Owl family was when they started to use their bass in a different tree. It actually took me about five days to find them there, as there were very limited viewpoints to see them. I found the parents and Owlets together. It was interesting because even though I'd filmed and watched the owls for about two months, I hadn't seen the parents showing affection to one another quite like this. heartwarming to see a loving family showing their affection for one another. This was the last happy moment we would all have together. One of the owls died the next day. I'd gone back to check on them but one was gone. It, its body was never found but it just disappeared. I couldn't keep an eye on the owls 24-7 but it must have happened in the middle of the night. The speculation. The speculation is all we had, but the only thing that was certain was that this once happy family of ours was now a family of three. I couldn't continue. I was, I was heartbroken. All the countless hours over the last eight weeks, watching the owlets grow and learn together, their affection for one another, the way they ate together, sat together, trilled together, gone. Their sibling alliance no more. I, I just couldn't. It was too much for me. I had to take a few days break from filming the owls or do anything relating to the owls. After a few days, I went back to film the family to see how they were doing, but they were gone. Nowhere to be found. I kept trying to search for them, but my gaps between visits were getting greater.
And so I believed my time filming the powerful owls had come to an end. Not entirely by choice, but because of nature. The owls had been out of my sight to myself and many others for over a week now. Had they flown together to a new territory? Had they found a quieter place to teach their last young owl at the final stage of adolescence before being left to explore the world on its own? Truly heartbreaking, having filmed them bonding together so wholesomely just over a week earlier. I had to accept that closure doesn't always happen in the way that we want it to. Nature is nature and does what it does. The circle of life doesn't always favour the characters of your choosing. It's not about the one, but the many. I've felt incredibly lucky and grateful to have been able to witness and film these powerful owls raising their young the past two months. It was beyond appreciation. With only one owlet remaining in the family, I wonder how the parents feel. Do they mourn the potential loss of one of their own? Did they move on due to their grief and needed a fresh start? Or was it just time to go? For me, filming these owls was not just about making a documentary on Australia's largest and possibly most majestic owl. It was also a well-needed task to keep my mental health in shape. Through the midst of the New South Wales lockdown, moving house, relationships ending, and physical rehabilitation, it was critical for me to have a project and task to set my mind to. And I couldn't have asked for anything better. The universe presented to me an opportunity at the right time, with the right topic, and the right location. I just needed to see that and take the leap, to have an awareness of my surroundings, to understand that life begins outside of my comfort zone. I had a booking for work overseas with my flight leaving that afternoon. It wasn't until a local photographer shared a post showing a picture of the owl chick, I had to contact them and ask for help. Help to find the owlet. It wasn't just for the documentary, it wasn't to connect the story together in a whole. It was for my own benefit, I wanted to know. I, I wanted to see with my own eyes the greatness that this owlet had accomplished. And to find out the outlet's whereabouts so close to my departure, I had to go. I had to make the most of my opportunity to find and film the outlet before it grew into a full-blown adult and became unidentifiable amongst its parents. It was nested deep inside a bird sanctuary, a place that the public isn't granted access, a sanctuary for the birds. A place where the birds can rest at peace before departing in their own way. And that is exactly what I felt the powerful I was doing, symbolically and literally. After losing its sibling, it not only needed to defend itself, but it needed to rely on itself. It was the outlet's time for independence, whether that be by choice or the rules of nature. The outlet was in the most difficult position to film. I had to use all the experience and skills I'd learned. But I'd learned to look for the signs and use my instincts, not just my mind. I knew I was so close to capturing it. I kept looking and about an hour later, I found it.
And here we are at the end of our story. What a ride it's been for me. The enticement, the connection, the learning and the adapting, both on my part as a cinematographer and that of the Owlets. What will happen for the Owlet? Will it find a mate? Will it continue in its life alone? Will it stay near to the parents? Who knows? As a wildlife filmmaker, I need to know when to put an end to things, when to say enough is enough, when to say that the story to be told is told. I think that it is a part of life and nature to let go, to allow the unknown to be the unknown. And cut, we're done.